Well, good morning, Hope City. Please have a seat. Good morning, good morning. Um, if you're new with us at Hope City, my name is Phil, one of the pastors here at Hope City. Uh, it's really good to be back with you in person. Uh, last week was a bit of a rough week for my family and I. Uh, it was finally our turn uh, to get COVID. And so that was us last week. Uh, really grateful for your prayers and for your support. And for those of you who dropped off meals, thank you so much. You guys saved us on those evenings. I want to also just quickly address um, the video that I made for you guys last week. I have heard that it is laggy, and I want you to know that's all me. That's not Ken. That's what happens when I'm left to my own with technology. Um, it just doesn't turn out well. So thank you for bearing with us. Uh, I heard the audio was clear, but um, it was like, you know, I was broadcasting from the space station or something like that. We're going to continue our series, What is Church? Uh, what a better time. I don't think there's a better time than now for us to talk about, first of all, our identity as a church, who we are, and secondly, our calling, what we are to do, especially as we are beginning to gather in person again. We are rebuilding, kind of coming out of this pandemic. So an opportunity for us to think clearly about who we are, our identity as, the church, as a church, and our calling as a church. And so today, what I'd like to do is focus on our calling to be community. That's going to be the, the major focus for our time together. But I do want to go through a quick recap, because I didn't get to do this in person, and I was so excited to. Uh, it has to do with our identity as a church. And, and I think it's not just us as a local church, you know, as us as Hope City, I really want to address this as us as the universal church. Or sometimes in the Apostles' Creed, we call it the Holy Catholic Church. We're not talking about the Roman Catholic Church. We're talking about the church global, the church throughout all time, the church that envelops all of the followers of Jesus since the very, very beginning. That is the church universal. That's the church holy and Catholic. And so what is our identity for us as being something, being part of something so much greater? And these are the four things that we talked about last week. Again, it's just a quick recap, but I want to do this in person. The first is, and this all comes from Matthew 16. Uh, we read the passage last week. We don't have time to do it right now. Again, it's a recap. But first and foremost, as the church, we are founded by Jesus and Jesus alone. And therefore, if we are founded by him, we are not uh, our own idea. We don't get to make whatever we want of ourselves. We are his idea. We exist for his purposes and not our own. That's the first thing that we need to come around as our identity. This is who we are. We are his idea. We exist for his purpose. And then we get launched into something else because this is the second crucial part of our, identi our identity. As the church, we're actually born into an ancient battle with hell itself. And this tells us that you and I and the church, we are part of a bigger story where the stakes are ultimately high. This is an ancient battle between good and evil. This has existed before the creation of the world, before the fall. And here's the thing, we have a part to play as the church. And so this tells us that we should expect there to be challenges. We should expect for there to be opposition. This is not going to be an easy ride. This is not a fan club for Jesus. He has purposed us to be part of this ancient battle with evil itself. And so you have a role to play, I have a role to play, and collectively together as the church, we have a role to play. Second part of our, a third part of our identity is that as the church, we are ultimately built by Christ himself. Like Jesus is the only one who can make something out of us something worthwhile, something that is a blessing to the rest of the world, something where we give him glory and we reflect his goodness into the world. He's the only one who can do that. 
But like we, if you look at the, the story of the Tower of Babel as human beings, we always want to make something of ourselves. And, and in some ways, we as human beings bring this into the church as well. And so collectively as the church, as the church universal, as the church holy and Catholic, at times we do need to repent of the ways that we've tried to make something of ourselves. And so when I see truth and reconciliation, when I see, you know, every child matters, these are opportunities for us as the church to repent of the things that we have done, unfortunately in Jesus' name, but, but it was too much of us. As the church, we are ultimately built by Christ himself. He is the only one who can make something out of us. We believe this not just for the, the entire church, but for us locally and collectively as well. And finally, and I think this is incredibly good news, if we're in a fight in which the powers that we're up against are so much greater than you and I, it is so comforting to know that as the church, we are assured that the gates of hell will not overcome us. You see, in Christ, as the church, we are actually called to take the fight to hell itself. This is an active posture, not a reactive posture. This means that we need to be engaged in dismantling the systems and the structures that perpetuate evil and oppression in our world. That is our calling. That is our identity. And out of that, we need to know that the victory is secure. Jesus has struck the winning blow. That's what we celebrate at Easter. And that's why we need to be formed by Easter. That he has struck the winning blow through the cross and through the resurrection. That sin and death may speak into the story, but it will not have the last word. And so this is our identity as the church. We are founded by Christ. We're born into an ancient battle with hell itself. We will be built up by Jesus. And as the church, we are assured the victory because of who Jesus is and what he's done. And so today I want to talk a little bit more about our calling as a church. And, and last week we talked about worship. And we talked about how worship is more about surrender than merely songs. It is about our entire lives acknowledging that Jesus is Lord, that he will have his way in our lives. That's what it means to truly worship. That what we do on a Sunday morning as we gather together is we're hoping that his grace, his mercy, and his holiness would reorient us, and we're trying to do this in an hour and a half, so that the rest of the week, the, when we leave here, we will continue to live lives that surrender to Jesus, that the worship would go on and continue. That's what we're trying to do here on Sunday mornings. It isn't come and we, we've done our worship for the week and we go and live however we want. This is the beginning. This is the reorientation of our lives. This is surrender. Today we're going to talk about community, and, and I want to define this as more than just, hey, we like each other, we hang out, we do a lot of stuff together, and we have a lot of fun, we share life. Like, I want to go beyond that. I think we need to talk about what it means to be a true community as a church where we bring one another before the Lord, and we're going to look at a passage that unpacks that for us today. And finally, next week, we're going to get at mission. I can't wait to get at this where we join Jesus in making the world new again. Last week in the video, I said that if I were to look and evaluate our church, and I, I don't want you to see this as me kind of judging you, okay? This is, in fact, if it's anything, it's an evaluation of what I have been doing as a leader. And the pandemic has given me a lot of time to reflect and a lot of time to, 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 to think about who we've become over the last nine or ten years as a church. And I said before that I think we are high on community. That's something that we always wanted to, to emphasize is connection and warmth. 
one of the things that Grace and I got to do before we planted Hope City was move away from Vancouver, which is my hometown. We went to LA and we experienced life as just newcomers in a foreign city. And we learned how important it was for, for, for a community to reach out in warmth and in care. And I think that's what we have tried to embody first and foremost in some ways. And you guys have done a fantastic job of that. So we're high on that. But if we're to really look at it in terms of worship, in terms of not just how we sing, again, I'm not judging what happens here, or the quality of our leadership, and they're wonderful. Worship isn't a main priority here. And then falling even beyond that, behind that, is, is mission. How, what is our impact in this local community? And as a leader, and as the one who's ultimately responsible for the direction of this church, I have to say, that's where I'm failing you. And that's why I want to come together in the next couple weeks, and we need to talk about worship. We need to talk about community. And finally, we do need to talk about and make a commitment again, once again, to, to mission. To being a church that has a tangible impact wherever Jesus has placed us. But today, why is community an absolutely essential part of the church? Why can't we just live stream from our couches? How many of you enjoyed that? And I really enjoyed that. I'm going to tell you. That was wonderful. My wife, you know, was like, yeah, why do, why do we have to go back to in-person? I'm going to say it's a temporary measure. It was something that we did during the pandemic. It's temporary for us. I think if you have health conditions, and there's, I think there's valid reasons for you to not gather, especially now. I wish we had the people power to continue the live stream, uh, but we're not able to, okay? So for those of you who have health issues, and we understand, absolutely, we understand that coming in, it, there is risks that, risks that you're taking on. But in some ways, I want to address how our live stream and our video recordings are content. They're not church. Church is primarily defined by, by worship, by community, and by mission. And that community aspect means that there needs to be interaction and relationship. There needs to be back and forth. There needs to be being known and knowing others. And so if we're serious about being a church as we come out of this pandemic, community is an essential piece. It's one of our primary callings as a church. I want to dive into this a little bit more uh, through Scripture. And today we're going to read Luke 5, verses 17 to 26. This is how it reads. One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why do you think these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Why is community an essential part of the church? 
I think if we look at this passage here, we see that it is a community that brings this man to Jesus. It's a community that brings us to Jesus. Secondly, it's a community that actually carries our faith. And finally, it is a community that Jesus responds to. Let's look at this very first thing that's happening. It's a community that brings us to Jesus. This is a story about the great faith of a group of friends. This is the story about the spiritual power we find in community. And it's a very simple story. Jesus is teaching in someone's house. The house is packed. The house is packed because people started to hear that Jesus had the power to heal. And this brought not only those who wanted to be healed, but this brought the scrutiny and the interest of the religious leaders from Judea and from Jerusalem. They wanted to see if Jesus and his teaching and his healing was legit. And so this house is packed. In fact, there is a crowd that's gathering around the house so that no one could get in or out. And Luke tells us that there's a story of some friends of this paralyzed man who bring him in hopes of getting in to see Jesus. Here's the thing. If you were paralyzed in the first century, you were pretty much destined to a life of poverty Possibly your days would be spent begging at the city gate or at the local market. If you were paralyzed in the first century, your present and your future would be pretty bleak. But this man has some great friends. Friends that heard about Jesus and how he's healed others. And immediately what they did is they thought of him. Friends who, who got together, scooped him up on a mat, and, and started making their way to Jesus. And then these friends, when they got to the house where Jesus was teaching and, and found it surrounded by a crowd, which made it impossible to get him in through a doorway, they didn't get discouraged. They didn't just get disappointed and just turn back. These friends refused to go away no matter how many people told them just come back later. This is teaching time. This is not healing time. Healing time is later. Or line up over there. They refuse to be turned away. These friends didn't just carry him to Jesus. These friends didn't bring him to the right place and then just line up politely and patiently. They tore through a building. They probably broke a law. They definitely embarrassed themselves. And they likely angered the homeowner. Imagine someone digging through your wall or your roof or breaking down your door. And they probably incurred a large bill, not just for the repairs, but they did all of this for the sake of their friend. They did all of this to make a difference in his life. And so when we look at this passage, the question that I think we need to ask when we reflect on this passage with regards to our calling as a church to be a community, the question is this, do you and I have friends? Do you and I have such a church community that will do anything to bring you, to bring me into Jesus' presence when we can't or when we won't go to him ourselves? When we are paralyzed, whether it is physically, emotionally, or spiritually, and we can't or we won't get to him ourselves, do we have friends who will bring us to him? See, as a church, are we willing to live as a community that will do anything to bring one another to Jesus when they can't or won't go to him themselves? We may not find ourselves physically paralyzed, but one day we may find ourselves unwilling or unable to come to Jesus. Do we have people who will bring us? Do we have people who will pray for us, who will walk with us, who will listen to us, who will knock on our door until we answer it, who will sit with us, who will be Jesus to us? 
It is a community that brings us to Jesus. We don't find Jesus on our own. How many people prayed for you that you would come to know him? How many people, when you were lost, cared for you and didn't give up so that in this moment, you're in a place where you can come to him? There were so many people who have brought us into Jesus' very presence over the years. It's a community that brings us to Jesus. But it's also a community that carries our faith. There are times in life when we as individuals, as followers of Jesus, we will struggle with doubt. That is normal. That's par for the course for those of us who follow Jesus. When we don't know what we believe, because life happens to us, or we don't want to believe, or we find it so hard to believe. Our faith will not survive the highs and the lows of life if we try to make it on our own. You see, the temptation we face when all is well is simply this, the temptation to forget about God. We need community to then ground us in gratitude and remind us when things are going well of the true source of all of our blessings. On the other hand, the temptation we face when life is disappointing is this temptation to blame God. You see, when things go well, we take all the credit. That must have been me. But when things go well or things go wrong, we give God all the blame. God, why? Why did you? How could you? We need community to journey with us to be Christ's tangible presence in the midst of pain and difficulty. Folks who stick with us as Christ sticks with us. Our faith will not survive if we try to make it on our own. We need one another. And I see this in this story that Luke is telling us. You see, I don't see the paralyzed man bossing his friends around and telling them what to do, directing them, encouraging them when they run into difficulties. He's largely passive in this story. Rather, the initiative, the plan, the reckless faith, and the courage, and the love is actually exhibited by his friends, by his community. They're the ones who won't take no for an answer, and that is faith. I'm reading into the story. I'm going to be honest with you. I am definitely reading into the story. But it's my imagination. And maybe it's me just putting myself in the paralyzed man's shoes but when I think about all the challenges that, that these friends have to overcome in order to bring him, lower him into Jesus' presence, there are so many moments, I believe, where they could have just simply turned back. Maybe there were moments that he said, guys, you've already tried hard enough. Thank you so much, but let's go home. Maybe like when they already carried him across town only to see the crowd in front of the house where Jesus is teaching. They got there too late. If I were the paralyzed man, I would probably say, guys, thanks for trying. But clearly we got here too late. Maybe we'll come back another time. It is impossible to get through that crowd. Let's go home. At least I got some fresh air today. I always, if you know me, I take the path of least resistance. If I'm sitting at a normal Vancouver you know, uh, a, not a stoplight because those will change for you. But sometimes in Vancouver, you just get a stop sign and you're trying to take a left onto a busy street. I'm the kind of guy that will do a couple of rights, however it takes to, to get me back on track, rather than to take that left. And it drives my wife crazy. I'll take the path of least resistance. Or maybe when his friends started to, to push through the crowd, now only to be turned back at the door. And now there's a bunch of people who are upset at, 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 at the friends, at the paralyzed man. And I imagine them being upset at me. And, and as someone who's a, a people pleaser, that's the last thing that I want. We 
We've literally stepped on some toes and we're still getting turned away. It would be so easy for me as the paralyzed man to say, guys, people are starting to be upset at us now. Let's just go home. Okay, this is probably going to make it less likely for them to give to me tomorrow if they all are angry at me. Or maybe when the friends, in a last ditch to actually get you to Jesus, they take you up a flight of stairs, put you down on the roof, they start digging through these tiles with their bare hands, and at this moment, you're like, oh, this is crazy, right? This is crazy. And now the owner of the home has probably run up on the roof and is wondering what you guys are doing and, and, and who is destroying their home. And as they start to lower you down, you see everyone look at you when you're in a prone position. And you're just not used to this kind of attention. And this is how I imagine it. I mean, if I were paralyzed, I'm used to feeling awkward, but I don't go seeking out this type of attention. This would be a different level of embarrassing. And you're just wondering when you're going to get thrown out with your friends. And you're literally just hanging there, feeling helpless. At this point, you might have wished that they, you would stop them from carrying out this crazy plan. But honestly, who knew that they would take it this far? But then Jesus sees the man being lowered in front of him. And he looks up, he sees his friends, and their faces are, are covered with dust and, and streaked with sweat. And scripture tells us that Jesus, when he saw them, he saw their faith. You see, it's a community that carries our faith, even when we don't believe anymore. There is going to be a day when we don't have faith or won't have faith, but we're carried by the faith of our community. It's not our faith that carries us through the ups and downs of our life. It's the faith of our community, the faith of our church. And one of the ways we do this is in the sharing of life with one another, in, in checking in. That's why when we did microchurch, the thing that we built in right at the beginning was check-ins. What are the highs and lows, especially during a pandemic? Especially when we're all isolated and in our homes and working from home while trying to maybe juggle kids, you know, or when we're on our own and we can't see anyone and it's so lonely. This is what we do as a church, we share highs and we share lows. We share doubts and we share fears. We talk about our disappointments. As a microchurch, like my microchurch, we, we reflected on the journey we, we were on. And we realized that we met together pretty much consecutively for 75 weeks. I have never met, you know, regularly with any other group that much before. But we achieved this, this level of togetherness, this level of caring for one another that I've never experienced in all my years of doing life and doing church. I think that's one of the things that we need to recover as we come out of this pandemic. It doesn't mean just signing up for a life group. It means what we do when we're there. Are we willing to be vulnerable and honest? Are we willing to carry each other? Are we willing to, to make our, our life groups safe places where people can express real disappointments with life, with God, with, with our doubts, with our fears as well? Are we willing to do that? That's community. Another way that we carry faith together is by reading and proclaiming the creeds of our faith. And that's why when we do membership, we do the Apostles' Creed. I'd love for us to be a church that incorporates this into what we do when we gather together. Because we do need to proclaim, not just to ourselves, but for the sake of each other, that which we believe. Because there's going to be moments when you and I are standing in the congregation and we can't barely read those words out, but I need my brothers and my sisters to read it and, and, and I need to hear it from them to know that this, this is what we believe. 
even though in this moment I struggle. Another way we do this is simply by singing our faith through the songs. So thank you to worship team and to the worship leaders and to Jen who's been faithfully leading this group for years before the pandemic, into the pandemic, during and coming out. There's going to be times where some of us don't want to sing or can't sing the songs, and that's totally okay. You do not have to. Those are the moments where we, those of us who are singing the songs, can sing the songs, want to sing the songs. That's our opportunity to sing so that you can be carried by what we sing and what we pray through those songs. It is a community that carries our faith. Our faith is going to go through ups and downs and highs and lows. And it's the community that provides the stability, the direction for what we believe and who we follow. And finally, it's a community that Jesus responds to. We've talked about how it's a community that brings us to Jesus. We've talked about how it's a community that carries our faith. Finally, I want to end here. It's a community that Jesus responds to in this passage. This is verse 20. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. What we need to notice here is that Jesus calls this paralyzed man friend, which is interesting because nowhere else in Luke's gospel does Jesus refer to anyone else as friend. Not that he doesn't have friends, but there's something about this man that, that made him address him as friend. And perhaps that's what's going on here is because Jesus sees and he affirms the beauty, the deep beauty of community in action that this group of friends would be so united in their love for one another, united in their faith and their determination on behalf of one of them, that they would go to any lengths to bring him before Jesus. Jesus calls this man friend because he sees that that's who he is. He is a man who has some amazing friends. And these friends are doing what I think friends do best, literally carrying one another's burdens and then seeking wholeness and healing together. And what we see in this passage here is that Jesus can't help but respond to that. It's a community that Jesus responds to. We can't do faith. We can't do life. We can't do church on our own. And that is why he has given us community. In Matthew 18, 20, Jesus says, where two or three of you gather in my name, there I am with you. If that's ever the guarantee or a reason for us, to see church not as content, but to see church as community, it is this. That when you meet with another person, it doesn't mean that Jesus just mystically appears somewhere there. It's that Jesus is going to appear through the person that you're going to meet with. He indwells each of us through the Holy Spirit. He will speak to us and he will minister to us through one another. That's how it works. This is why when pandemic hit, we went in the direction of microchurch because we wanted to emphasize community over content. And believe me, this was not easy to do. Our initial reaction was, well, let's just do our worship services and throw cameras up and just record what we do. That was our initial reaction because we wanted to preserve what we knew in terms of a Sunday worship service. But as we thought about this more and more and potentially how isolating this pandemic and this quarantine could be, we wanted to lean in on connection and community. We wanted you to continue to experience Jesus with you and near you through community and through one another. And we couldn't do that through an online worship service. You know, I believe you can get great content through an online worship service, but you won't be able to replicate community. You won't be able to replicate the relationships. And you won't be able to replicate the way that Jesus will encounter you through your brothers and sisters. 
If Jesus responds to us through community, what does it mean for us to commit to participating and rebuilding this community as we kind of come out of this pandemic here? I know we do life groups. There's things that we can do online or in person. That's one way to connect. Another way, I think, as we kind of get back to meeting together as a larger group, and this is sort of new for us after taking a break for over a year and a half, I want to encourage you, I want to invite you, if you consider Hope City your church home, then please look around. And if you don't know somebody that's sitting near you or next to you, this is what I loved about the church before pandemic. People would just warmly welcome those around them. It wasn't the responsibility of only the pastors or only the ushering team. We were a, com we were a community that did that. I know it's a little awkward during the pandemic. I know when we only see half the face, it's hard to remember who's who. But let's give it a go. Let's try at this. A couple discussion questions uh, for us in our life groups or for you when uh, you want to process some of what we've talked about today. First question is, who are the friends who will stop at nothing to bring you to Jesus when you can't or won't go to him yourself? Second question, what are the tangible ways you can bring others to Jesus when they're unable to come to him themselves? Next question, how can our community lovingly support and walk with those who struggle with questions and doubt? I think this is real. We need to learn how to do this a lot better. Not be a church that drives away those who doubt or those who are struggling in their faith, but how can we be a church where this is a safe place to ask questions, a safe place to not be okay, a safe place to, to be angry at God, upset at God? How can we lend our faith to them during times when their faith is faltering? How can we be a church that, that's able to walk with, keep our, maybe at the right time, speak, but most of the time keep our mouths shut and walk with people? And finally, what would making a co commitment to community look like for our church? We have this opportunity coming out of this pandemic to kind of rewrite and reinvent who we are. It's incredibly exciting to me. I think we have an opportunity to reflect on what we've learned over the last two years. We have an opportunity to say, what is community for us and how can we do this to the best of what God has given us? And what would that look like for you and me? We each have a responsibility in, in making community um, something that is wonderful, something that not only we have a lot of fun in, but where I want to hear stories of, of people being Christ to one another. I think that's what it means for us to be community. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you. We ask that as your church, you would do your work in and through us as we rebuild, rebuild our community, help us to get set in ways that reflect who you are, your goodness, your love, your generosity, your forgiveness, your grace, your mercy. And as a church, we pray that we would be able to, to bring one another before you, Help us to rebuild community as we come out of this pandemic. There's been just so much fear and distance and the encouragement to stay away from each other. Help us to know how to draw near again. And let us bring one another before you. That is our prayer. That is our goal. We pray this in your name. Amen.